Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the Ecosystem Genomics Seminar Series. My name is Megan, and I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Sociology here at UA and the Cultures of Science Fellow for Bridges. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jenny Cross to you this afternoon. Dr. Cross is Director of the Institute for Research in the Social Sciences and Professor of Sociology at Colorado State University. Dr. Cross is a community sociologist who works with large transdisciplinary teams on projects related to urban transformational change and urban regenerative development. She has spent two decades investigating team collaboration processes across a range of contexts, including interagency coalitions for public health, green building design teams, <laughs> sorry for baby noises, <laughs> and transdisciplinary science teams. Furthermore, she has led the development of a series of interactive workshops for building individual and team competencies for team science at the Colorado Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. Her work has been acclaimed by colleagues in academia, community agencies, and local government. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Cross. We are looking forward to hearing more about the mechanics and the magic of great team science. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm really delighted to be here and delighted for all of the extra visitors. <clears throat> Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we're on today and that I'm on and that I live on um, is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne and Ute Indian nations and peoples. This was the site of trade, gathering and healing for numerous other native tribes as it is at the intersection of ecological zones and those ecological zones are spaces that draw species and human communities together across difference. <clears throat> we recognize the indigenous peoples as the original stewards of this land and all of the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties that nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land grant institution, and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion, and that our founding came at a dire cost to native peoples and nations whose land our university was built on. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, our responsibility, and our commitments. <clears throat> These land acknowledgements are personally important to me, I studied place attachment for my research and I think that the human connection to land is one of the most sacred relationships that we have. So I think it's important for us to recognize these. I know that you all are at the University of Arizona, which is on land and territories, territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education, offering partnerships and community service. I'm honored to be connecting these two land grant universities together and reflecting on our obligations to our relatives around the world. <clears throat> One of the messages for team science is to make space where we all are connected and can belong, where we are able to show up as our full selves. Around the world, people are struggling to be present and to maintain work because a sovereign nation has been invaded by another country. And people around the world are feeling that empathy and the suffering of our colleagues. Science is a privilege and it's a privilege that's founded on our freedom and the privilege to be housed and fed. Only then do our minds have the capacity to explore and to build relationships with each other. So I wanna just recognize that for some of us, it's harder than others to be present today. 
This is one of my favorite quotes from research and studies about science. No one wants to leave part of their personality and their inner life at home, but to be fully present requires that we feel psychologically safe. We must feel that it's okay to share who we are without fear of recriminations. We have to be able to talk about what is messy and sad, to have hard conversations, and we can't be just focused on efficiency. So I think that um, our land acknowledgements and thinking about what's happening around the world today help us to understand one of these core principles of team science. <clears throat> I got started studying team science years and years ago when I studied complex teams. And I first started studying public health teams and thinking about how people across differences collaborate with each other and how those collaborations grow and build over time. And in those early studies that I did <clears throat> on public health, I found that trust was at the core of everything, that people were not able to collaborate because they had a history of not trusting each other. A decade later, I was called to study innovative design teams in the green building industry. And the same thing showed up there. I interviewed designers and architects and builders and building owners and construction managers from around the world. And they said to me, Jenny, the most innovative buildings are built by the teams that have the deepest levels of trust with each other. The more you work with someone, the more you learn to shape your mind, to understand what they're thinking, so that even when they're not in the room, you can think about what critique they would have of your own thinking. And you only get there through relationship and time and trust. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is relationship and time and trust and how all of those things help us to have the capacity to have those tough conversations and to create the groundwork that allow us to do complex thinking. The slide you're seeing right now comes from <clears throat> a white paper that we wrote on the integrative and green building design on the phases of integrative processes and thinking about social network analysis. Those of you who've seen me talk about team science before know that social network analysis is my personal favorite um, measurement tool for understanding complexity and integration and thinking about teams. You're gonna see some more um, network slides um, in a little bit. Um, Jimmy? Yeah. Hi, this is Scott. Are we, am I not sharing my screen yeah. at all? We're, I've been we're talking this whole time okay. with no <laughs> screen sharing. <laughs> oh, you guys blocked me? Oh my gosh, I am dying right now. I love you guys. Someone needs to talk fast sooner. Okay, here's the slide on the Colorado land acknowledgement. Here's the Arizona one. And Wait, we're still not seeing them. Still not seeing my slides? I'm seeing them. Oh, yep. yeah, I also see it. Okay, now they're there. Here they yes. Okay, Colorado land acknowledgement. Arizona land acknowledgement. This is the slide I'm talking about now. I put my slides in the wrong order, but really importantly, when I was quiet for a minute, this is the slide I was hoping that you were reading. You guys were all so wonderful, quiet, <laughs> respectful, and I thought you were just reading my moment for humanity. So take a breath in and recognize that we are facing challenging times. Okay, back to the presentation. <laughs> so I've been studying integrative teams for a long time. I'm sorry, my screen was not showing. Zoom does weird things on my double screen. I actually can't, it doesn't indicate to me and show me when my screen shows or not. <clears throat> so I can't tell because I have a screen full of you guys. So teams are hard because the more diverse they are, if we're doing interdisciplinary science, we want more diversity. We're trying to tackle really tough problems in the world. And there are a couple diversity paradoxes. We're gonna talk only about one of them today. One of those diversity paradoxes is that the more diverse our team is, the more complex and complicated it is to have them have high performance. Diverse teams absolutely have the capacity to be more high performing than homogenous teams. And that's the thing we really wanna keep focused on is that how do we help diverse teams arrive at their potential to be higher performing than homogenous teams? In order to do that though, we have to do things like building um, trust and building that capacity. The guys that I interviewed about innovative design teams and they said, Jenny, most effective teams come from us spending time together and learning to think like each other. <clears throat> 
how do we get there? How do we arrive at that? And what are the processes through which we do it? So that's what I wanna talk about today. When I was thinking about all of the literature on the science of team science and the competencies and the behaviors and how we build it and how teams grow and change over time, it's really complex. And there's a whole bunch of different frameworks and they're all overlapping with each other. I just decided that the best way to think about it is that it's really like a web or maybe like a honeycomb that all the pieces, each piece supports the other pieces. It's not a path, it's not a hierarchy, it's not a linear progression. It's a set of components that when each one is complete, it supports all the other ones in their completion and their wholeness. And each one is its own and unique and matters, but each one also is part of the whole. So it is simultaneously um, part of the system and its own unique unit. <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges for performance of teams is that diversity adds complexity and complexity increases our cognitive load, what make, which makes it harder to coordinate with each other. So the more interdisciplinary our science is, the more it can slow us down and make it harder and slower. It also has the capacity to increase our conflict. Fortunately, the solutions that help one of these are also the foundation and the web and the honeycomb structure that fix all of them. We're gonna think about these honeycomb bits in two sections. But the first is to recognize and remember what the people I interviewed in public health and in innovative design teams, what they all say is that our team's performance hinges on our safety, the sense that it's okay to criticize each other. Bob Fox, um, an architect that built the Bank of America building in downtown Manhattan, he said, you can only build a great building if the facilities guys feel safe enough to come to me and say, Bob, I see these beautiful designs, but they are a really dumb idea. And if those guys can't tell the architect that they have dumb ideas, you can't create innovative buildings. So we're gonna think about how do we really build those. <clears throat> the core, the kernel in that creating safety begins with ourselves, our own self-awareness that we know what kind of butterfly we are. If we're a monotone butterfly and that monotone is what our team needs, if we are a multi-talented butterfly, if we traverse across different ecologies easily or poorly, it matters that we know who we are and what the strength is that we bring to our team so that we understand the strength and complexity that all of our team brings. There are dozens of models of team science competencies and specific behaviors. I picked this one to share with you today. This was published uh, most recently in 2001 in a special issue of the Journal of Clinical and Translational Science. And it's a model that's been tested and refined on the specific behavioral things that are easily measurable about how we train people in the competencies and behaviors for good team science and how we can measure them. <clears throat> I love this article too and put the reference here so that um, you also can find, um, they have a really great table that summarizes how their models and competencies map across other ones. So before I said it's kind of a complex web of a whole bunch of ideas and I think that they have a really nice integrative table. So if you just Google team maps and busy 2001, you'll be able to find it really easily. When they talk about the behaviors, they talk about them as existing in three buckets. The first is about our own awareness, which I just spoke about, individual awareness and exchange. How do each of us share our own unique ideas and how do we bring forth those unique ideas in our team members through inquiring and probing, through reframing what people say, through integrating and through developing shared language. <clears throat> we also must be about the business of building trust and psychological safety. We do that through seeking the perspectives of others, acknowledging people's contributions and their uniqueness, including them and addressing issues and resolving conflict. We also do it through our individual and our team assessment and self-correction and adaptation that we are monitoring and debriefing ourselves and our team's performance. We are reflecting and analyzing on what we're doing 
and we're creating new plans for development. So I hope the message you take from this is that our team science skills are not things that we accomplish and are done with, but they are dynamic. They are things that are in a constant state of development, practice, and use. So that building your teaming skills is about practicing what we know are the good tools. <clears throat> Ultimately, solving the integration problem is about reducing the cognitive load and reducing the cognitive load of complexity, of difference, of diversity, and of coordination of all of those tough tasks. So we're gonna think about <clears throat> part of the honeycomb structure first, which is about our experience, learning from having been on previous teams, that all of the things I'm talking to you about here have citations. If you wanna ask me later, I can tell you like who documented this, but I'm also gonna share some of my own research that documents these things. Having experience on teams before improves our capacity to work on the next team. Building social connections with individual people and team members helps us form new teams and it helps us sustain the teams that we're in. Having past collaboration and science helps us to understand each other better and build those things like shared language and shared vision. So current social connection and past relationship both separately and together facilitate trust and psychological safety. And those combined are part of the strategy for reducing the honeycomb that reduces the cognitive load on diverse teams. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about collaboration experience. This is some of my very favorite data in the world. It comes from studying um, students at CSU that are taking courses that are focused on collaborative team science projects. These are students in my class on community development we were working with the Sustainable Transportation Group and trying to understand how could we improve people's commute to campus and also meet our city's greenhouse glass goals and the campus's um, challenges with growing. So these are a couple of my students talking to people um, all over campus. We wheeled this whiteboard around to capture people and their experience. Students come to my class and they say, you're gonna make me take a whole class that's all just one team assignment. You're crazy, Dr. Cross. I hate team assignments, they suck. And my students aren't wrong because in their past courses, they haven't been taught the tools about how to manage rules and to have clarity and all the things that make teams function well. And so they come in with little experience in good teamwork and very little instruction or capacity building and they're frustrated. By the end of my class, or usually like a third of the way in, my students say, Dr. Cross, could you please go give an instructional lecture to all of my other faculty members to explain to them what the structures are that help teams be successful? And the good news is we absolutely, all of us individually and as leaders of teams can learn and build these skills to create environments for teams and structures that will make it easy for them to be successful. Here's what we learned from studying different types of courses. We studied regular capstones that are kind of seminars. We studied internships in the social sciences. Students often get sent out um, to learn in company settings and then come back and reflect in kind of discussion groups on campus. And then we have community-based research classes in lots of different fields that are focused on solving community problems where the community agencies help define the research agenda itself, and then the students are working in teams together. And we found that community-based research courses in English and sociology and construction management all share these traits, that the activities in the class look the same, even though the content of what students are learning is different. The questions are initiated by community, the work is structured as collaborative learning, the Assignments themselves are focused on active learning and applied projects and project-based learning, and they include the best practices from service learning, which are reflective writing and metacognition. It might also include other things that the education literature thinks might contribute to high-impact learning, but we think it's the stuff in the, the primary activities that's really what define high-impact learning for students, but more importantly, 
how they build their capacity for teams. So <clears throat> when we think about building capacities for teams, I'm gonna talk about some of the specific behaviors that we all need to engage in that are our one-on-one -on -one interaction routines, our team routines, and our ongoing practice. So one of our team routines, our daily activities, and our ongoing practice needs to be team check-ins and icebreakers. In fall of 2020, I taught my first class completely hybrid. I had students in Germany, Michigan, Utah, Colorado, and California. And I had students in my own classroom and some outside. I had students with immune deficiencies. I had students with newborn infants. I had students who moved home because their families had lost their jobs and needed someone to be there. And I had to figure out how to pull off this community-based research project that was normally on the ground in town in some kind of remote space. So we started every class with some kind of team check-in for how are you doing? There are lots of different ways to do it. Some of you might have seen during the pandemic, the little nine square questions, which is on a scale of sheep. How are you feeling today with nine pictures of sheep? My favorite version of that is um, on a scale of Nicolas Cage. How are you feeling today with nine pictures of Nick Cage from all the ridiculous movies he's been in? But there are other ones in um, on boards that people can do. It's just as easy to do this remotely as it is online. We checked in every single day. I spent 15 minutes of my class of a 75 minute period just doing check-ins so that every one of the 30 students in my class could tell us how they're doing. Halfway through the semester, my students said to me, Dr. Cross, I've never ever experienced this. I have never in my educational career been asked how I am. And it's heartbreaking to me to know that in education, we don't spend our time doing this. We need it as human beings. We need it when times are tough and we all need it on our teams. It is part of the foundation and that builds trust and vulnerability and a sense of feeling safe of being known that makes it possible for us to do hard things with each other. And so strangely answering questions like, if you were famous, what would you be famous for? Makes you a better scientist. So I just give you this idea. This is one of the habits and routines that we need to practice. And in academic culture, we're missing it that we don't do this enough naturally. <clears throat> Here's the beautiful, wonderful data from those community-based research courses in um, different fields across my campus from computer science to construction management to English and humanities and sociology. We looked at teams and looked at how people are connected to each other. This is an international sustainable building design course with students from CSU and an international university at the very beginning of their time together and they get to know each other so fast that their communication network looks pretty super connected to begin with. But then it's so connected later on that there's <clears throat> very few ties that don't exist. This communication network is one of the important things that we look at in all teams to see how they're functioning. But we learned something. Remember I told you at the very beginning that the more you work with people, the greater your capacity to work together in the future. So that metric I just showed you, the communication network is something we measure in every class at the beginning and the end of the semester when we study them. Here's the study abroad class that we just looked at. You can see the gap, how, how much growth there was in all of the potential ties across different types of relationships and across every possible pair from the beginning to the end. And then notice these three capstones. Something funky is going on here. This is one faculty member in the same semester, in the same department, teaching the exact same course with three different sections. And in sections one and two, their communication network um, at the end of the course looks the same as in capstone three, which is actually a touch bit higher than where the other courses ended. So one and two ended their semester where number three began. And we looked at the state and we said, what's going on? And we checked rosters. Very few of these students had had classes with each other, so we didn't understand what was happening. We suspected that this capstone three was the result of students' past relationships with each other. But when we looked at just the general rosters from the university, we couldn't figure it out until we interviewed the students, and this is what they told us. 
they said, oh yeah, we had classes together, but not as a whole group. There are three other community oriented classes in this department. One is a design challenge. One is called Construction Management Cares, which takes students out into the world to build things for um, people and agencies in the community that need help. And then the third is that study abroad class where they're doing um, sustainable design on the ground in an international, in a different country. <clears throat> so three different groups of students who had built relationships with each other in three different classes, all of them enrolled collectively in capstone three. And so here we see not the history of a team coming together, we see the history of teaming coming together to advance the capacity of this group to team. When we interviewed this faculty, he said to me, he said, Jenny, this class was like magic. We started on day one, like I end the semester with my other students. And it's so sad for me between the fall and the spring semester every year. I end on this high, the fall semester, I've built community and I've built teams and we know how to work together. And that feels so great. Then we go away on break and I come back and I start all over again. And I have forgotten how hard it is to not know people and to not be a member of a team. And something was different with this class. I showed up on day one and I felt like we already had community and I don't know why. I didn't know any of these students. I'm not sure what happened. And that's when we interviewed the students. So I want you to really understand this past experience on teams translates to every new team that you go to. <clears throat> this is the trust at work again in that study abroad team and how we think about past relationships. <clears throat> um, it's not just the communication network, how much do you talk to that started a new level. This team was a brand new team and they started with a level of trust where they only had previously known maybe 20% of the other people in that class, maybe less than that, but knowing a handful helped this whole team build trust much faster. So I think this data is really exciting. <clears throat> Social scientists who study trust in teams know that trust is an active, dynamic thing. We are either building it or we are tearing it down. It is not a static condition and it is an evolving state of teams. Trust builds over time. The more we trust someone, the more willing we are to engage in risky things, the more able we are to channel, to work on and tackle challenging problems. The more we do it, the better we're at, the more we trust each other so that it becomes a self-evolving cycle if we don't do things that disrupt it. Scientists, sociologists who have studied <coughs> um, trust on teams and repetition on teams have found that kind of the golden rule is to have 60 or 70 percent of your team be incumbents with people and at least like 50 percent of your pairs having had a past pair with someone on the team. So this data from bibliometrics on hundreds of thousands of publications looks just like the data from my college classroom that the more you team, the higher level of trust, and then the more experience you have, the greater capacity to move faster and to team better. One more quick data point of our own. This one is under review right now. Um, this is a publication from ecologists who managed to get 60 or more scientists to share data from around the world and publish two articles with each other. And we were interested in the role of leadership and of trust and past relationships with each other. And you can see how sparse the leadership network is. Who do you see as a leader on this team? And you can see though how dense the trust network is. You can see there are people that are kind of pendants, those kind of purplish nodes that are on the edges, don't know each other and trust as much, but the core of this network has a lot of people who have strong trust with each other. There are no isolates. Um, in this network who don't trust anyone. Some people have only one or two trusting guys, but there's no one who has no, no nodes that have no trust in the network. When we compare all of the network relationships and ties to each other, and to look at which network tie is the most predictive of trust ties, we find 
that having worked together on joint projects is the most predictive. This data is super exciting to me because for sociologists, when you think about like odds ratios, we normally get excited about odds ratios that are like two or three times if something like increases the propensity of a tie to exist like two or three times, we get really excited. But here we see that joint projects, the odds ratio there is 68. And so more than anything, past relationships helps teams work together. So this is not surprising. This shows just like what the spiral is. It's just a different, different source of data and data in a different um, form. <clears throat> so we talked about this first part of the hive. Knowing people, having worked on teams together with each other, but also just your own individual team experience and spending time in those routines to build social connections so that people feel seen, recognized and heard is the foundation for team science. We still have more work to do though, to reduce that cognitive load for complex teams. And here's where the work shows up in our individual teams that we need to really work on the clarity of roles and developing shared language and debriefing, which is that um, competency you saw before about our own monitoring and adaptive capacity. When we think about role clarity, <clears throat> we again want every butterfly to know what kind they are, but we also need to understand what kind of butterflies our whole team is. Not just what's their science expertise, not just what cool methods and tools do they know, but also what is their secret superpower? Because every member of your team has a secret superpower and you want to uncover those. You also want to think about how you can align the roles on your team with the strengths that your team members play. And you can't align roles with strengths if you don't understand the diversity of your team members strengths. And then teams have to be have demonstrate this adaptive capacity, whether it's in the moment to step in for someone because they are out on leave for some reason or because they suddenly have other jobs that are really pressing that they need to step in for. Teams have to have this capacity to adjust expectations on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis to meet the needs of teams because if we don't feel supported, we don't feel like we can step back when we're feeling overwhelmed, our team can't keep functioning. So teams are not a static roster, they're an adaptive functional structure. I'm a symbolic interactionist, a social psychologist. I think that the power of the world is in our routines. And so it's how I frame how to think about your team science behaviors and your teaming capacity, which is for you to have some high level reflection and insight on what you're doing weekly, quarterly, yearly, you know, the time interval that it's not like that it's weeks and quarters of the magic intervals, but that there are short intervals and long intervals that you want to think about what are the things that you're doing that are producing role clarity. When I started working at an interdisciplinary um, institute on campus, the greatest gift I got from them was the director saying to me every year when I did my annual review, he said, Jenny, tell us what roles you want to let go of and which ones you want to grow into. So that thinking about my strength and my own growth and development was a part of creating role clarity for the Institute. And it was part of our yearly practice, as well as our daily coordination. When we're talking about projects, people would say, I know I promised to be the lead on this one, but this new one came in that's more aligned. I want to shift over there and who can change roles with me and take on this other one. So from a weekly basis to, you know, semi yearly to yearly, we want to be thinking about and having transparent conversations with our team about what roles people are playing and which ones they contribute best to because of their strengths. So just pause for a second for you. I want you to think about for a minute and maybe to put into the chat, how do clear roles reduce cognitive load on a team? If cognitive load is like all the stuff that's weighing down our brains and making it hard for us to think, how do clear roles reduce cognitive load? Betsy says they clarify expectations. 
knowing what you don't have to worry about because it isn't your job. I love that response. When I hired an assistant director for my institute, I said, I don't wanna worry at all about the finances and what's happening. I, I, I get to take all those things off my load because it's not my job. You're not spending time trying to decipher what you're doing. Yeah, knowing who to go to because you know it's their job. Reducing duplication, not feeling like you're duplicating others. And it helps every individual focus their thinking. Great, that is a perfect set of answers. Thank you for um, participating. So remember getting diverse teams and complex teams to performing well, it hinges on our capacity to feel safe and to reduce the cognitive load for the team. So what are all the things that we're doing that help reduce that load and help us feel like it's fun and safe to be there? The other thing we have to do, and this should be the fun of interdisciplinary teams and team science, is building together a shared language. I got my PhD in sociology, and then in the intervening 20 years, I have spent less time at sociology conferences than I have at conferences in many other fields, in education, in construction, in psychology, in interdisciplinary studies, in um, sustainability. So this can be fun work, but if you're too worried about all that other stuff, because you don't have real clarity, it's hard to do this work, which is the intellectual work that we want to do that feeds us and stimulates us. This goes back to those kind of core behaviors that we saw in that first kind of slide with the columns. We need to be able to share our unique knowledge. Every member of our team needs to have the opportunity to do that. We support each other in doing that by probing about their ideas so that we can expand our learning, understand the definitions that they use, learn to use coding the way computer scientists do instead of the way qualitative sociologists do, and that we are able to build and refine on each other's ideas. This should be fun work, but it takes time and it takes active listening as well as an iteration from each other. <clears throat> if we think about shared language practices and routines, these also need to be part of our daily lives as well as our monthly, quarterly, and yearly lives. So we should be working on this clarity and contributions in our one-on-one -on -one meetings with each other, in our regular and weekly team meetings, when we host specialized ideation sessions, when we have seminars and retreats, when we have conferences, every one of those is an opportunity for us to expand our own understanding of the knowledge that other people use and to be sharing with others. My favorite examples of this shared language and shared knowledge and understanding are um, when an outspoken member of the team is missing from a meeting and we're talking about an idea or thinking about a solution and someone will say, well, I know Matt's not here today, but if Matt was here, he would ask us to think about X. And that putting yourself in another team member's perspective and shoes and knowing what questions they would ask is a sign that we are starting to achieve that kind of integration, but shared language is not a one-time activity. It's something that we have to work on and build and it takes trust in order for us to <clears throat> do this kind of knowledge sharing. The last thing is about debriefing and adaptation. We all need to be self-reflective, self-aware and growing. And as a team, we need to be self-reflective and self-aware and growing. When we, studied, when we studied those students who had graduated from community-based research classes, we asked <clears throat> alumni 10 years out, what did you get from this class that was meaningful? And um, we had a student say, I'm a leader in the Coast Guard. And the most important thing I learned in that class is what I have to do every day. Every day in my job, I need to understand where is my team? What are their challenges? What are the things that they need support from in order to be able to grow? And how do I help them? That's what I learned how to do in this class, in this team project, and it's what I use every day in my job, and it's responsible for me getting promoted faster than my peers. When I read that, that's like gold in like a sociologist like data acquisition. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, educational psychologists have a term for that. It's called collective 
cognitive responsibility. That we each have the capacity to take responsibility for where the group's cognition and capacity and activity is. And that we're taking responsibility not just for our own growth and learning, but for the growth and learning of our team. How do we get there is again through routines. Having structured and regular feedback for individuals where we talk to each other and we talk to our team about the things that we're doing well that we want to continue, the things that are not working for us that we need to stop, and the things that we want to start. I have made a commitment in this next year to get my department to stop wasting 15 minutes with announcements when we have 20 people in the room. That's hours of time that could be an email. Retrospectives, retrospective reviews is something that comes from a Scrum methodology, which comes out of the software development field, but we use it in lots of classes and all kinds of teams use this kind of cyclical feature of like working on projects for a sprint a short amount of time, but making sure you end it with this retrospective review, which is asking the team, how did we do? What was fun? What was hard? What helped us? And then the last one, liberating structures, are the ways that we facilitate meetings. I put the link to this liberating structures um, at the bottom here. There's a website. Facilitators use these and know these. You might know them in your own classrooms. You might have participated in a workshop where people, we did something called Think, Pair, Share. The Think, Pair, Share is the same as the one, two, four, all, giving everyone time to think, asking people to share in pairs, and then sharing in foursomes. This is a liberating structure because it makes that time together accessible to everyone. Some people are slower processors and they need more time to think. When you give everyone that quiet time, it levels the playing field so it creates more equity on your team. And then when people share in pairs, everyone gets to speak, not just the loud mouse like me that wanna answer the question before the teacher has even finished asking it. And then sharing in fours helps to build community and creates more time for everyone in the room to have their own voice heard and less time for the person in the front. And then sharing all is the opportunity for integration. There are lots of them on the website with directions on how anybody can facilitate them and use them. And so the many of these are designed specifically to help teams identify their problems, overcome challenges, deal with challenging things. So there are like regular routine things like retrospectives, but there are also more kind of interventions that you can find there. So in debriefing and adaptation, we should be giving people individual feedback all the time, every day when someone writes a brilliant email that like nails the appropriate response, just a like short smiley face, like great job is really important. Having our team meetings focused on how do we overcome our challenges helps us be engaged in the regular work of collective problem solving rather than individual isolation <clears throat> and having those places and times regularly and especially annually where we're having fun together but also then talking about how we've done well and how we can improve in the future thanks heather all of these things our past experience on teams how we are working to know each other as human beings to make space for the good the hard the ugly the easy the joy meeting people again, getting to maintain our relationships in teams, and then working on these kind of like harder structural things about language and making sure that we're debriefing and having roles. These are the behaviors of individuals and they're the practices and behaviors of solid teams. All of these things build trust and each one of them individually helps reduce the complexity and noise and cognitive load from diverse teams, which allow us to perform well. So collectively, this is the structure of behaviors and routines of teams and of individuals that lets us achieve success as teams. So I didn't walk through each one of these individually, but just a reminder that this model really has some great examples of really specific behaviors and measures for each of these that you can use for your own team or that you can use for educational programs that are trying to develop individual and team capacities in science so it's a beautiful reference that um, touches on all the things that i talked about 
I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Wow, what a great talk. Thank you so much. I'm hoping somebody will ask a question. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of burning have... questions out there. Nobody wants to be the first. <laughs> Betsy says, <clears throat> How can new teams, trusted, experienced team members, best welcome new members in a new team without being a click? That is a really uh, great question, Betsy. Um, there's a couple of things. <laughs> One is our regular routine practice on Teams if we do the check-in and we go around and we ask everybody how they're doing. That is really potentially a transformative daily practice because every voice is in the room. So the more that we make space for the routine of every voice in the room, the less we experience clicks. And the more we fight against the human tendency to sit next to someone you know and to pair up with somebody that you know. So those routines are really super important. Then you also wanna have special routines, which are actually having a kind of welcoming party for new members that you want to introduce them and celebrate them and do a variety of things. Um, my own team has been um, onboarding a bunch of new members who all of our staff are starting remotely and it starts with an email from the same person um, behind the scenes. It says, hey team, brand new person is coming on board. Here is their email and their phone call. Each one of you should reach out to them and say welcome aboard and schedule a meeting, whether it's coffee or meeting or whatever. And that way it feels more organic instead of like planned and structured. We are informally, everyone's reaching out. And then we have those official meet and greets, like we have an official lunch where we just share and get to know each other. And then we have one-on-one -on -one meetings with teams. So think about that scale from what's the ritual with the whole team to what are rituals with individuals and how do you go at that kind of comprehensively. <clears throat> I do not know how to pronounce your name, um, Jitanjali, but I don't know if, I don't know how you pronounce the J in your name. It seems like the flip side of the positive feedback of teams and trust is that in a non-social dysfunctional situation, things get worse and worse. Suggestions for breaking out of this. That is a brilliant question. So remember the spiral that I showed you on trust? You're either spiraling trust up or you are spiraling it down. And so you do have to have a break in an intervention. Um, I would start with, like in really practical terms, I would start with pairs of people meeting outside and talking about what they would like for that team to be and kind of coming up with some creative ways to help forming some social rituals. A specific intervention for teams that you might do is from the Liberating Structures um, website, affirmative interviews. So that's a session that you could do in um, less than an hour with a team and you could intentionally pair people up with people on the team that they don't know and ask people a question that you think is important and relevant to the team and follow that structure as a way to start um, building that trust. You could even have a session that says, how can we build better social relations on a team? But I would, I always tackle things two ways, like a head-on evidence proven intervention, and then also the behind the scenes kind of like um, building a web of people that are thinking the same way and sharing ideas with each other. Um, okay, May asked a question. I just have to get my chat up so I can see better. How do you suggest one finds their superpower or discuss that of team members? <laughs> um, this is something I'm gonna do with students in a little bit, <laughs> uh, is talk, have them talk about it. I find that younger people are harder at, har find it more challenging and harder to do 
than um, older people, but sometimes it's actually really easy for team members to identify each other's superpowers. So I do this with um, my graduate students. I tell them that my superpower is thinking about the big ideas and my like kryptonite, my weakness is like proofreading and editing, right? So I always need to be paired if I'm working on a grant with someone who's a good finisher and that's not me. Um, I also have worked in places where the person doing reviews, when we finish our annual reviews, that same institute I was telling you about that I learned to identify what roles I want and ones I don't, we do 360 reviews where we ask people this question what do you appreciate about the staff member that is their unique contribution? What do they bring that is unique and special and enlivening to the team? And so when the team all writes that about each other, then we kind of process and encode it. And then when we present it back to each other, we talk about at the end of the review cycle, we have a team meeting and we talk about what are the accomplishments of the individuals and teams. So we have a little celebration for each person their celebration and the team things. And then we also um, name the superpowers, just like, you know, funny names. Um, and so it's a part of our annual ritual is to name each other superpowers. So um, I think you could make a game of identifying and naming them on your team. I think we're probably at time here if i didn't get to your question um <clears throat> heather megan and scott know how to reach me you can email me at colorado state university um, and i'm happy to answer your uh, further questions about team science thank you so much jenny it's a pleasure having you today and uh, i hope everybody got as much out of it as i did Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Jenny. Everyone have.